Hello, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Angel Storm. Today, I want to do more of an in-depth teaching so that you can start to apply some wisdom to various areas of your life. And today, I'm talking about when intention becomes tension. I am going to be talking about this in terms of narcissistic abuse recovery, of course, but I also want you to understand this is something that can apply to any area of your life. And especially when you feel like you're not receiving breakthrough in an area, like you've been working towards a certain goal, you've been working on a certain thing, and you haven't been able to really get that breakthrough and really see the result that you're after. Today, I want you to maybe consider that your intention has actually become tension and what happens when, when that occurs. So for starters, intention, the word means the deliberate, purposeful planning or desire behind one, one's actions. And this obviously shapes our societal norms. It shapes our ethical considerations. But more importantly, it shapes our interpersonal relationships but it all starts with the relationship that we have with ourselves. So when we understand and when we are able to explore this complex process of recovery from narcissistic abuse where manipulation and exploitation have blurred the lines of genuine intent, this will help us redirect our moral compass. It helps us guide our behaviors individually so that when we interact with other people, it's in line with our values. When we understand the difference and the importance of intention, we are able to make decisions that are truly in line with who we are and who we want to be, where we want to go. Even in our legal system, we have such a thing as a harsher punishment for somebody who intended to cause harm or intended to have an ill effect on somebody else as opposed to if they did it unintentionally. So in our legal system, we have this understanding that intention is a very important part of what makes up safety, what makes up trust, what makes up norms inside of our cultural system to the point where we are willing to say, if you intentionally harm somebody, you deserve a harsher punishment than it, if it was an, an accident. But when we think about intention for ourselves, and specifically when it comes to a narcissist, I want you to see how off we get with the intentions, right? At a personal level, understanding and aligning intentions within relationships is vital for understanding and building and fostering healthy connections. When we have clarity in our intent, we can establish boundaries very clearly, we can have effective communication, and we ultimately reduce misunderstandings or reduce the tension that is built in an interpersonal relationship. When we rely on shared intentions to build trust, to build emotional intimacy in romantic relationships, we can feel like we are working towards the same goal. But when you understand the intentions of a narcissist, we are able to actually see where we got off course. A lot of times when I start working with clients who are recovering from narcissistic abuse, they want to look at everything else other than the narcissist's intentions. They want to look at the vows that they made during their marriage. They want to look at the things that the narcissist has said to them in the past. They want to look at, well, maybe I didn't read this pot book or go on the, you know, listen to this podcast. Maybe I don't have enough knowledge. Instead of actually going down to the very root of intention of what the narcissist actually had in mind when they went into this partnership of a marriage, typically, or as a parent, right? When a narcissist is a parent, it can be very difficult for, for the child of that parent to say, my parent was a narcissist. And because our, our societal norms tell us that the spouse or the parent should be looking out for their sparse spouse or their child, right? And so instead of actually looking at intentions, which would clear up a lot for us when we're recovering from narcissistic abuse, we don't want to say that this person was intentionally evil to us, that this person intentionally set us up to fail, set us up in a position to believe what they said, and then it turned out that that was not the case. We don't want to believe that. And so we, we go on this long, drawn-out journey where... Instead, if we would look at the intentions, it would clear things up right away. Again, it's looking past the charm, the ability to deceive, the ability to manipulate and gaslight. 
right? When we look at the actual intentions of why somebody is doing that or saying that or repeating that behavior, then we can get to the true understanding of the nature of the person doing these steps, right? It's a crucial, it's a crucial step in your own healing. So when you're in the throes of the psychological aftermath of this manipulation specifically, we often overlook this crucial part of understanding intent. But but doing so will actually help you reclaim your agency and construct a more authentic self and a more realistic view of that relationship right away. Okay, so when we understand intent, understanding intentions is a very important part of your healing process, but also, you know, the legal system, ethical considerations, interpersonal relationships, and ultimately the relationship that you have with yourself, which is the most important relationship that you are going to have. Then you can start unra unraveling the layers of the manipulation, the effects of that manipulation. You can acknowledge the impact that the narcissist intentions on you had. It can help you come face to face with your own intentions, right? And this is especially important when you go forward and you want to establish boundaries for yourself first and in the relationships that you have with other people because your boundaries will help make sure that you are uncovering intent in the other person or parties that you are getting into a relationship with. This is what fosters a renewed self sense of self and a renewed trust in yourself to make decisions, healthy decisions for your life. So tension, broadly defined, is a force that is created by opposing elements or conflicting emotions, right? So in the physical realm, tension is observable as the stretch or strain in materials. Think about you know, a rubber band being stretched, you, we can say it's under tension, right? And then in the psychological domain, in the emotional domain, we can see the strain resulting from conflicting thoughts, emotions, or external pressures to do a certain type of behavior or to conform to a certain standard. This can also be found internally. One of the clear ways that you have tension going on in inside of yourself is this thought of one side of me wants to do this and another part of me wants to do that. This is a tension. This is an internal conflict that is absolutely going to come out in your outer world. When tension is left unchecked, when it is not addressed, this results in chronic stress. It results in anxiety, physical ailments, loss of sleep. All of this is a result of prolonged exposure to tension. Unresolved tension within yourself will hinder your personal growth. It will hinder the personal, the interpersonal relationships that you have and the growth of those relationships, and it will contribute to mental health challenges. So when when we talk about this happening in the context of narcissistic abuse, tension is an absolutely necessary ingredient for the environment of abuse to grow. The narcissist's intentions are to create a an environment that fosters that promotes prolonged abuse and the continue continuation of abuse so the building of abuse once again i say that there are two addicts in this relationship the narcissist is an addict because the amount of supply that they need in order to fill their energy tank needs to grow just as with an alcoholic you know if they're having 10 beers today, 10 beers is not going to be enough in a year, okay? It's the same level of, of needing more with a narcissist. And so the environment has to perpetuate this growth of tension in the atmosphere. The other addict is the codependent in the relationship. It's the victim in the relationship. It's the person who is unwilling to say, this person's intentions aren't, align aren't aligning with mine. And that person's intentions are to do me harm. We're going to look for every other reason. And we're going to call it a bunch of different things. I'm having patience. I'm giving grace. I'm, I have the gift of mercy. We're labeling this prolonging of abuse of ourselves. We are participating with it. And we also will treat it like a test. I can endure more. I can go through more. I can, this isn't the worst that I've ever seen. Or, you know, I, I know that I was built to handle this. We call it a bunch of really nice sounding things as opposed to saying this environment 
is equivalent to the boiling pot of water that the frog is sitting in, who doesn't know it's boiling. You know, by the time he realizes it's boiling, it's too late, right? Because it was a slow, gradual buildup of this tension in the atmosphere. So the gaslighting, the manipulation, the emotional volatility, this this contributes to an atmosphere of perpetual tension. And victims are finding themselves staying in this constant state of alertness. They're anticipating the abuser's unpredictable reactions and they're walking on emotional eggshells and they are trying to do this within themselves. If I say this, what is he going to say? If I do this, what is she going to do? And you're thinking about it 10 steps out in the future. You're causing the tension that's in the external environment to get inside as well. So again, if you do not understand how to tell when an environment is not only not toxic, but just not healthy. It's not the one that's going to promote your absolute growth. Your your 100% potential is not being pulled out in that environment. You're going to find ways to just continuously try to adapt to and tolerate that toxic environment. When you can understand and recognize the building of attention in a situation and be able to mitigate that, be able to navigate how do I diffuse this environment, it's a, it is again a crucial step in your recovery process and in rebuilding your sense of security as a person. You need to be secure with who you are. You need to be comfortable in your own skin. You need to be comfortable in the environments that you are operating in, your home, your job, your church. These types of things have to be there to support your growth. So when you understand how to identify, manage, and alleviate the tension, this is where you start a new building process. Okay, so now that I have explained these two things, intention and tension, let me tell you how these two things come together and often get conflated, right? Because a lot of times people will say, it's my intention to have a healthy marriage, or it's my intention to make a co-parenting relationship work, or whatever the situation may be that, that you're facing with an abuser. Your intention can get wrapped up so much inside of yourself without an appropriate outlet, it will cause tension within yourself and therefore cause that thing that you are seeking to go further away from you. Before I uncover and get into all of that, I want to say manipulators will use guilt complexes. This this results in an unconscious feeling of duty to the manipulator. And this is absolutely necessary in order for that environment to continue to grow. So if you think about the environment having a structure, the external environment has a structure on which abuse can grow. It is the foundation that this stuff is laid. Guilt is the number one thing. Because it creates this beholden feeling like I, I must do this. I have a sense of duty to my parents, to my spouse, to my pastor, to my boss, whoever it is in your situation, you can feel this unnecessary sense of duty. And it's actually not duty. It's, it's, a, it's guilt. You're going to call it loyalty. You're going to call it covenant. But it's actually guilt when you look at it. And again, getting to the intention is why it's, it's so important for this to happen in order to actually be successful in recovering from narcissistic abuse and moving forward and having a healthy life in general. When your heart and mind have lived under this oppression for a long time, only a concrete course of action will draw you out of this pattern because now we've laid the foundation not only with that person, but we're going into every other relationship with this built-in foundation of, okay, I have a duty to this person and I have a duty to this, this structure. I have a duty to this corporation or whatever, okay? And then the number one way, the concrete course of action that I want you to apply right here is to stop justifying yourself. This is a place where treating the illness also eliminates the cause. This is a case for a, a treating the illness eliminates the cause. You do not need to try to convince yourself that you don't owe anybody anything, okay? The, if you have a habit of apologizing for the slightest reason, I want you to try to adopt a different habit. Only explain your actions when it's absolutely necessary. There really is no need to tell yourself that you are not beholden to somebody else. 
it's okay for the guilt feeling to be there when you are starting this process understand the guilt the feeling of guilt is going to be there but you don't need to reveal it externally again boundaries are for you first if you cannot hold your tongue if you cannot hold in the the i need to explain myself to this person i need to justify myself to this person then you aren't able to set a boundary with that person because you can't set one with yourself first so once the manip manipulator realizes that they will not get the same output from you anymore, they will leave you alone, okay? And your heart and mind will gradually get used to the new feeling of not having that guilt structure there anymore. So you don't have to justify yourself. You are right. And now your guilt doesn't exist anymore. So it's it's a completely ignoring of this other structure causes it to deteriorate and go away. That feeling of guilt will disappear and with it, various associated problems will disappear as well. Inferiority complexes are a result of guilt. And this is what makes people feel incapable. And then that feeling is reflected in their physical reality. So when a person actively tries to elevate themselves as a response to feeling insignificant or incompetent in some way, their importance decreases equal to the extent that it is emphasized. The more you try to elevate yourself, the more you try to make yourself feel like I am capable, I can do this, I am worthy, is equal. There's an inverse relationship. So the more this goes up, the least likely people are able to see your genuine, true, authentic value in, in your natural world. So the opposite is also true. A person who does not have a concern for how other people view their significance has it automatically. The attempt to strengthen your position and the emphasis on your present qualities is an illusion. And you're just chasing after a reflection. If I'm the value, me trying to convince everybody, look at my value, is having myself chasing this reflection. And instead, people are actually seeing what I can't see myself. So how do you prove to yourself that you are special and that you don't have a need to prove it? There is another feedback chain by which the cause eliminates the effect. So rather than trying to prove yourself or to show off that you have all that it takes to, you know, do a certain thing or, or get a certain position or overcome a certain challenge, rather than doing that, to just increase your own significance in that standing, when you manage to stop doing that, then the people around you will intuitively sense that you your significance does not need to be confirmed outside of them. What this is, is actually another form of manipulation. You're just trying to get other people to validate your standing and your identity. When you stop trying to use manipulation to get that, people will give it to you freely. When your heart and mind are gradually penetrated with the conviction that you are in fact worth something, then there comes a moment where your intentions start moving towards you. Right now, you're creating a tension because you're coming in like, I am this thing, versus allowing it to just flow and your intentions drawing the things that you need into you. There comes a moment where, where this will start to happen. Your self-esteem will start to improve. It will be like this inferiority complex was never there at all. That guilt structure was never there at all. Doubts, stress, fear, all of that will substantially ruin the picture of you, you inside of your individual world. So don't forget that once your these thoughts are reflected, something will enter your outer world that validates that feeling. The greatest damage caused by anxiety is suffered by the goals that you set. Listen to me. The greatest damage caused by your anxiety so the thing that's going to suffer the most is the goals that you have set. These are not in alignment with your values. When you are trying to do this from a place of tension, of anxiety, of fear, of striving, anxiety transforms desire into longing. Listen to me, what I am saying here, anxiety will transform your desire into longing. You need to abandon that feeling of waiting that feels like longing. Otherwise, you won't get anywhere. You're creating tension that is not drawing in your intentions. Your intentions are always a result of what's in line with your values. 
when you feel like I need this person to do this, I need this person to change, I need this thing to happen. When you're doing that, you're causing tension, which is distorting your intentions. You might have pure intentions of I really want, you know, a healthy relationship so that I can, you know, pour out my love onto that person or build something incredible with that person. That's all well and good. But when it starts getting distorted through anxiety, through guilt, through this false inferiority complex that you're you're building, it will attract to you only people who can survive in those types of atmospheres, which are always going to be abusers. When you understand the way that your intentions are formed and do not allow them to become part of tension, you have to allow this to be something that is natural to you. It just flows out of you. It is not a, a striving. It is not a proving Otherwise, you're you're creating more of this structure for anxiety to exist in. You're creating more environments for abuse to happen. When your intention gets shifted into tension, you are aiding in not only your stagnation, but your evolution as well. You are going to devolve from the place that you started at when you initially decided to go after that intention. This is why understanding yourself and valuing the relationship that you have with yourself is such an important part of your recovery process, but also just in general. Your your growth as a human never ends. You're either growing or you're dying. There's no in-between. You're not ever staying the same. And so when you understand that, you can really make sure that your intentions are always staying in alignment with your values and that they're not being transformed by anxiety into tension. If you want help doing this one-on-one, -on -one, I have opened up new coaching sessions, but they are limited in space. So I have linked the site where you can go and check out those coaching packages, the emotional alchemy coaching packages by far the one that most people are signing up for. So I know this was a little bit of a longer video. I just wanted to do something that really dives into your inner world so that you can really have a blueprint for how to start evaluating what you're doing. You know, ask yourself, is this in line with my values? Number one, ask yourself, what are your values? And then start to see places where you've allowed these structures to get built on the outside of you simply because that's a reflection of what's inside of you. And then you can start to really build and focus on the things that truly matter to you and start making choices and ultimately become the person that you were created to be, that you want to be through these changed behaviors, sustained changed behaviors. And with that, I will see you in our next video.